just to get started, uh, my name is Molly. I am the reference librarian here at Mentor on the Lake. I'm going to do a program on the Green Book. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what the Green Book was, how it started, what the uses were for it, a little bit about discrimination in the United States and hazards of traveling while Black. And also, I'm going to talk a little bit about the movie. When the movie came out in 2018, there was some controversy with some of the family members of Don Shirley, and we can get into that a little bit more. And then we can get into some of the modern things and other resources that you can check out. Also, I want to say a little bit about... Um, there's some words that I might have to use that I'm not comfortable with, so I probably will substitute using the word black. Okay, let's get started. So this is going to be about the Green Book. And the Green Book was started as a guide for when people were traveling in the South, but not also in the South, but to find places that were friendly to Black travelers in the United States. The Green Book was started by Victor Hugo Green. In his 1948 edition, he had written that there will be a day sometime in the near future when this guide will not have to be published. That is when we as a race will have equal opportunities and privileges in the United States. It will be a great day for us to suspend this publication for then. We can go wherever we please and without embarrassment. Now Green was a postal worker in Harlem, New York. While Black Musicians, they traveled regularly for work. Other African-Americans were interested in traveling and they traveled for various purposes, for better educational opportunities and for their children to go on vacation. And Hugo Green believed that they wanted to get away from their old surroundings, to see, to learn how people live, to meet old friends and new friends. So in 1936, the Black Motorist Green Book was published. Green and other Black travel guide writers believe that road trips provided a path to self-improvement and self-actualization. What it was currently happening, a lot of times there was a beginning of a Black middle class when this began, be to become published where Black families no longer had to take public transportation because they could own cars. Um, they had great jobs. A lot of them actually worked for the automobile industry. So they were buying cars. They had better economic opportunities. They had moved north in the Great Migration and out of like the Deep South. So then they had some money and some chance to go on vacations to travel without having to take public transportation. And what Green did is he established a network of his postal workers, and this would be nationwide beyond Harlem, who helped with the distribution a big partner in that was Esso Gas Stations, which was Standard Oil back then. They were owned by Standard Oil. The executives there at Esso believed that they could open up a whole market with Black Americans. And Esso Gas Stations were also friendly places where travelers could get fuel, use the restroom, because a lot of times in during segregation times, there were a lot of establishments where um, Black people could not use the restrooms, and the same as the whites. 
Um, so ESSA was friendly to all travelers. So then they could pick up actually the green book there. So what it listed was it provided gas stations, clubs, liquor stores, resorts, beauty shops, doctor offices, hospitals, and tailors that were friendly to African-Americans. They were listed in the green book. And black businesses were encouraged to advertise in the green book. And so what was going on uh, was to have the idea that you're gonna have some more freedom on the road and more control over where you go and basically be able to travel the United States without having to be in a special railroad car or in uh, Montgomery, Alabama, they would actually, if white people continued to get on the bus, they would make black people go towards the back of the bus. And when it became too full, they would actually make black people exit the bus. And that's part of the reason why there was a Montgomery bus boycott because people were getting pretty tired of that situation. And so it was believed that African Americans could nudge the cause of civil rights by exercising their freedom and mobility and their power of the purse, so to speak, or to be able to spend money. This is also, it was written uh, that Blacks in America were determined to obtain justice and nothing would stop them. And the determination is it was unanimous and it was expressed at every level of life from the zoot suitor to the college president, from sharecropper to soldier, from preacher to labor leader. And that was written by Polly Murray in Common Sense Magazine in 1943. So the Green Book catalog black owned businesses around the country and it directed motorists to establishments that served a wide range of functions. There were several dangers for black drivers in America. This country wants to say segregation and Jim Crow only happened in the South, but it happened all over. And the Green Book was created by a New Yorker with listings in New York, but there were places in Harlem where even black people were not allowed to go to even back then when it was first started. And so this was something that was everywhere when the Green Book was started. And that was by filmmaker um, Reichen. She um, actually did a documentary called Traveling the Green Book and that was on the Smithsonian Channel. It's a good history of travel with the Green Book as your guide. So Black Americans were subject to racial discrimination and even racial violence while migrating or traveling in the United States. So the Green Book was a great way to understand how you could get from point A to point B safely. And even though it wasn't all about struggle and fear, there was a seriousness to traveling while black and there were severe consequences in some cases. And that's by historian Candace Taylor. She also helped with the Smithsonian documentary. So let's talk about, put it in a little into context and we'll talk a little bit about what Jim Crow was and that was institutionalized racism, and that was mainly in the South. So as you can see, they divided the drinking fountains, the swimming pools, the restaurants were segregated at the time. And what Jim Crow was, it was a name for a racial caste system which operated primarily, but not exclusively, in southern and border states between 1877 and the mid-1960s. And Jim Crow was more 
than a series of rigid anti-Black laws. It was a way of life. Under Jim Crow, African Americans were relegated to the status of second-class citizens. Jim Crow represented the legitimization of anti-Black racism. So the Jim Crow system was undergirded by the following beliefs or rationalizations. Whites were superior to Blacks in all important ways, including but not limited to, and this is the belief of Jim Crow, um, to intelligence, morality, and civilized behavior. They also believe that sexual relations between Blacks and whites would produce a mongrel race which would destroy America. Um, treating Blacks as equal would encourage interracial sexual unions. Any activity which suggested social equality encouraged interracial sexual relations. If necessary, violence must be used to keep Blacks at the bottom of the racial hierarchy. Now, this was what Jim Crow's belief the laws that were on the books, primarily in the South, to segregate the races. Um, it was the belief at the time under those circumstances. So let's talk a little bit about sundown towns. These are towns uh, where you have racial discrimination by intimidation. These were towns where basically a lot of black workers would work there during the day, but they better get out of town before it got dark. And there's some newspaper clippings here about just violent things or threat of violence against black people. And a little bit more about sundown towns were also known as sunset towns, gray towns, or sundowner towns. And they were all white municipalities or neighborhoods in the United States that practice a form of racial segregation by excluding non-whites via some combination of discriminatory local laws, intimidation, and violence. Um, entire sundown counties and sundown suburbs were also created by the same process. And the term came from signs posted that colored people had to leave town by sundown. And the practice was not restricted to the Southern states, at least until the early 1960s. Northern states could be nearly as inhospitable, inhospitable. <laughs> they could be as bad as to black travelers as states like Alabama or Georgia. So discriminatory policies and actions distinguish sundown towns from towns that have no black residents uh, for demographic reasons. Historically, towns have been confirmed as sundown towns by newspaper articles, county histories, and the work progress administration files. They are corroborated by the tax or US census records showing an absence of black people or a sharp drop in black population between two censuses. So between the two 10 period, 10 year period between censuses a steep decline or showing that there were no black people living in the town. We're gonna to talk a little bit about Route 66. And there's a map shown here. Um, it was called the Mother Road and it was co to connect urban and rural America from Chicago all the way to Los Angeles crossing eight states and three time zones. So you can kind of see where it's going through here. Um, so just one year before the construction of Route 66, the Chicago Tribune 
suggested an editorial on August 29th, 1925, that Black people should avoid recreational sites along the proposed route altogether um, for their own safety. Route 66 started out in Illinois, a state that itself had nearly 150 sundown towns. The road certainly did not mean freedom for everyone, and it bore witness to some of the nation's worst acts of racial terrorism. One violent night in 1906 in Springfield, Missouri, which would soon become the birthplace of Route 66. Though the road starts out in Chicago, the route was officially designated as 66 in Springfield. So during a grisly lynching on Easter weekend, a vigilante white mob dragged Horace Duncan and Fred Cocker to the town square. They hanged them, burned their bodies while thousands watched and then distributed their body parts among the crowd as keepsakes. So this is definitely um, violent and um, a degree of terrorism. Also along Route 66 in 1921, the Tulsa race riot erupted in, Greenwood, in the Greenwood District of Tulsa, Oklahoma. It was one of the nation's most devastating acts of terrorism against African Americans. Greenwood was an unusually vibrant community of successful black entrepreneurs, doctors, and lawyers. Booker T. Washington called it the Black Wall Street, and it was arguably the wealthiest black neighborhood in the South. But after a young black man was wrongfully accused of assaulting a white woman, an angry lynch mob broke out. Long held jealousies over black prosperity and Greenland's wealth ignited a riot. White mobs set the neighborhood on fire. After 16 hours, at least 300 people had died. 35 blocks of the Greenwood district had burned to the ground and more than 10,000 Black residents had been left homeless. So that was some of the dangers that were presented to Black Americans just before that road was laid down. Also, on Route 66, every mile was a potential minefield for Black Americans, businesses with Three Ks in the title was a code, such as Cozy Cottage Camp or Clean Country Cottages were a code for Ku Klux Klan, and they only serve whites. And Black Motors, of course, also had to avoid sundown towns like Edmond, Oklahoma in the 1940s. The Rice Cafe, located right on Route 66 proudly announced on the postcards that Edmund was a good place to live, 6,000 live citizens and no black people. For many, the vulnerability of the road meant always having a plan, a cover story, or even a disguise. One popular safety precaution, a chauffeur's hat, uh, black motorists who drove nice cars were especially susceptible to regular harassment by law enforcement. In the 1930s, the black columnist George Shire wrote, blacks who drove expensive cars offended white sensibilities and some blacks kept to older models so as not to give the dangerous impression of being above themselves. Now, down below in the bottom, there's a 1940 seven map down here of Route 66, which was in the Green Book, and then there was a 1956. And as you see, there's not really that many more businesses on the later map, but that would give safe passage to people using the Green Book uh, places to stay and to eat. So let's talk a little bit more about the Green Book. 
Despite all the dangers, millions of Black vacationers did explore the country, many relying on a unique travel guide. The Green Book featured barbershops, beauty salons, tailors, department stores, taverns, gas stations, garages, and even real estate offices that were willing to serve Blacks. Just what you've been looking for, so now you can travel without embarrassment and harassment. Back in the 1950s, Nat King Cole, rather a famous singer, entertainer, he had his own television show, but during one of his shows in Alabama, he was actually attacked by white supremacists in Birmingham, Alabama. He was part of a scuffle where some men were going to come to his performance and pretty much try to stop him from performing and maybe even try to kill him. So this is an excerpt from an article in the newspaper. So Nat King Cole the entertainer today canceled three appearances in southern United States and left for Chicago to rest after being attacked by white men while he was singing with Ted Heath's band here last night. Mr. Cole received a slight back injury during the scuffle, and today six men were formally charged with assault with intent to murder him but later the charge against four of them was changed to conspiracy to commit a misdemeanor. And then later police reported more than a hundred white men had planned to attack Nat King Cole and overpower Heath's band. They said the affair had been planned four days before it took place. A total of 150 men from Birmingham area and nearby towns were supposed to arrive at the auditorium, but the mob did not show up. So we're going to talk a little bit about the Green Book film um, was a 2018 American biographical comedy drama body film and it was directed by Peter Farley. It was set in 1962. And the film is inspired by the true story of a tour of the Deep South by African-American classical and jazz pianist Don Shirley and the Italian-American bouncer Frank Tony Lip Begulola, who served as Shirley's driver and bodyguard. And the film was written by Farley, Brian Hayes, Curry, and Tony Lip's son. And his name was Nick. And it was based on interviews with his father and Shirley. And the film is named after the motorist guide. But um, one of the complaints about it is it was not, the motorist guide was not actually featured very much in this film, but the concept of traveling across the country while Black was part of the idea. So Don Shirley, he was an American classical and jazz pianist and composer, and he recorded many albums during the 50s and 60s, and he was experimenting with jazz with a classical influence. He also wrote symphonies, piano concertos, cello concerto, three string quartets, a one act opera, and works for the organ, piano, and violin. Um, he did a symphonic tune poem that was based on 1939 novel Finnegan's Wake by James Joyce. And it was set of variations on the 1858 opera Orpheus in the Underworld. And during the 60s, Shirley went on a number of concert tours, some in the deep south states. And for a time, he hired New York nightclub bouncer Tony Lip as his driver and bodyguard. 
So Tony Lip, he was an American actor and an occasional author. Um, he is best known for his portrayal of the crime boss in the HBO series, The Sopranos. So you might recognize him from that. He portrayed a real life crime family mobster and Donnie Brasco. And so he had a, a bunch of acting roles in several movies. Um, his debut was actually in The Godfather where it said that Coppola had seen him at the Copa Cabana. And he did write a cookbook and kind of a novel called Shut Up and Eat in 2005. I believe Main Branch has a copy of that. So if you're interested in checking that out at some time, you can put a hold on that one. And he was also Don Shirley's driver in the 1960s. So this is a comparison between the actor and the real life um, Don, Shirley, Don Shirley. Um, and here's the actors and they, of course, in the movie, they're going to try to make them look as much like the real life people. And then um, she portrayed Dolores, the wife. So like in the film, um, the true story unfolded mainly in 1962 and Tony Lip was a bouncer. He was employed to drive and be a bodyguard um, for Don Shirley as he traveled in the South. And, but Don Shirley was not really born in Jamaica. So it's kind of, his manager thought it seemed more exotic if it seemed like he was born in Jamaica, but he wasn't. Actually, his um, father and mother emigrated from Jamaica, and they were very uh, well-to-do. Um, and Don Shirley was actually born in Pensacola, Florida. And his father, he was an Episcopal priest and his mother worked as a teacher, but she died unfortunately when he was nine. Uh, Shirley was known to play the organ at the church where his father was the preacher. Um, he could play the organ very well at a very young age. And he was a prodigy and he started performing with the Boston Pops. Um, he did a lot of things. So as you see here, um, here's a portrait of his family. The family is portrayed a little bit differently in the movie and we'll kind of talk about that a little bit. So this is uh, 1936. This is the Don Shirley family, his brother Calvin and their father, and Edwin, Maurice, and Don Shirley in the spectacles. So he's the cute little kid with the glasses there. So based on a true story, yes and no, but that's Hollywood. Um, they actually condensed their trip of maybe two years into two months just to get fine points out in a movie because a movie is a different format than real life, of course, or a biography or something that's a documentary. Um, so the white theater producer, um, Saul, he, he um, convinced Shirley that he should not pursue a classical music career an American audience just really wouldn't want to see a black pianist on the concert stage. So he convinced him to focus more on pop music and jazz and Shirley ended up taking his advice and he did make a fusion of music between jazz and other types of pop music to create his own genre. 
And as a result, the performances in nightclub instead of the concert halls, but he hated the nightclubs because he felt the audience didn't respect the music enough, but you know, gotta make a living. So according to the Lips son, Nick, who helped write the script, and then these are stories that his dad told him, and he also knew Don Shirley. These are stories that were told within the family of their road trip. Now, um, the Lip did end up, he, he was racist and he admitted to it before the trip. And if you've seen the movie, the character is shown throwing out some drinking glasses that some African-American um, men were using to drink from what the, the, the African-American men were working at the house and he actually threw them in the trash. So you see that to, to me, it was kind of shocking, but, and he admitted to it uh, before he went on this road trip. He was racist. He was also a um, very interesting person. He was a minor league baseball player. He served in the U.S. Army. Um, he also, of course, was the bouncer at the Copacabana. Um, so they did take this trip. And while on the trip, uh, the lip, he noticed ways in which Shirley was discriminated against and humiliated and included not being able to eat in the restaurants where he performed or use their restrooms. And he also witnessed physical attacks, violence against Shirley. And the Lip son said that the trip significantly changed his father and changed the way that he raised his children, instilling, instilling them the belief that all are created equal. So, in the movie, um, after getting pulled over, um, the lip got enraged because the police officer called him a derogatory name for Italians. Um, and the lip did punch the officer and he and Don Shirley ended up in jail. But it happened a year later, it was in the fall of 63 and the incident took place in a separate road trip. So these are just ways that the movie's different than real life, but sometimes when you're telling a story in a movie, it has to be a little different. Um, so they take artistic license. Um, Don Shirley was friends with Robert Kennedy and he actually did take some time out of his concert tour to attend JFK's funeral. There is a documentary called Lost Bohemia, and it's about all the artists that lived on top of Carnegie Hall. There used to be apartments there, and Don Shirley, of course, when you see him in the movie, he's on a throne, he's in this building in his apartment. And actually the real Don Shirley did live on top of. Carnegie Hall. And the controversy arise, arose when the Shirley family said that they left him completely out of the film process, filmmaking process, and that it was filled with falsehoods. And uh, Dr. Marie Shirley, Donald's brother, called it a symphony of lies. Shirley's family's most glaring accusation tore into the movie's central tenant that Don Shirley and Tony were, weren't even friends. They're saying it was an employer and an employee relationship. But the true nature of the re relationship is kind of murky. I mean, they, they were friends, were they best friends? You know, it went a little beyond employee, employer. There are some YouTube videos and also Deadline put up some audio tapes that they were using 
to help write the movie and for the actors to get ideas about their real lives. And it was recording as the actual Tony and Mr. Shirley, Dr. Shirley, um, talking about their lives in this road adventure that they had had. From the audio tapes, Shirley is saying in the last Bohemia movie, it's a 2010 documentary. Shirley says, I trusted him implicitly. You see, Tony has got to be, not only was he my driver, we never had an employee employer relationship. We did have time for that. Um, my life is in this man's hands. Do you understand me? Do you got to be friendly with one another? You know, I taught him English and he was one of the Lower East Side Italians who had a jaw like a bulldog. And in the movie, you also see that Dr. Shirley is helping Tony write letters home. So the Green Book Traveler's Guide is gives a rundown of hotels, guest houses, service stations, drugstores, taverns, barbershops, and restaurants that were known to be safe ports of call for African-American travelers. Um, so for further reference, you might wanna go back and rewatch that movie, um, take it with a grain of salt because some things are Hollywood and some things are true. You can also explore the YouTube and some of the audio recordings. Um, a more modern thing to check into is there's actually a podcast and it's called Driving the Green Book. And you can get that wherever you can get a podcast. You can get it on um, an internet, a internet connected computer or you can download them on Apple Podcast or Stitcher or wherever you get them. But um, I've listened to some of these and these are actually stories that are told by people that had traveled during these times or they were children and they tell stories about their family or their aunts or uncles and about traveling in segregated South in the United States. Um, it is really an interesting um, podcast to listen to because you're going to hear people's actual stories and their own voices and it's very nice to do that. And um, sorry about the technical difficulties. Here are some of the resources that I used and I'm gonna open it up to questions or comments if you would like. 